Hello and welcome to Utah State University's Nora Eccles Harrison Museum of Art, also known as NEMA. Opening in 1982, NEMA is an academic art museum located on the Logan Utah State University campus. NEMA is home to roughly over 5,000 works of art created by women, minorities, and underrepresented groups of peoples. As an institution that exhibits modern and contemporary works of art, NEMA prioritizes their representation and spotlighting of lesser-known artists, some even local to Logan or Utah. One of the many exhibitions that NEMA has to offer has been curated by one of Utah State's own students within their art program, being Gabby Shea Zollinger. Why don't we go have a look inside, shall we? Gabby Shea Zollinger is a student in the art history program at Utah State University. After falling in love with art history by taking the same humanities class not just once, but twice during high school, she knew art history was something she wanted to pursue. Zollinger's inspiration stems from a desire to explore and focus on the progression of depictions of women, clothed and nude, through the art world, specifically focusing on the scheme of Latin American art for this exhibition. Thus, the exhibition that we will be exploring today is named For Vanity's Sake. The pieces selected detail the aesthetic progression of both the varying nude and clothed depictions of the female body within Latin American art. In the sphere of the art world, the concept of the male gaze and female gaze exists as it does in other walks of life. The idea of women being vain and self-centered towards their outward appearances did not come into existence until it stemmed from male-headed ideations of men projecting their views on women, perpetuating the idea of a male gaze. For vanity's sake is meant to spark conversation and discussion on how it is necessary to see representation and depictions of the nude female form by both female artists as much as male artists. It is vital to realize that women artists will be at a disadvantage with self-adorational and nude art pieces as they are brushed off as vain, no longer trying to appeal to the male gaze that so many male artists apply to their works and instead turn to a female gaze of depicting women. The first two images that we will be visiting are some of the earliest depictions of powerful female figures dating to the pre-Columbian era with non-European style of clothing without the need to hide their body parts. Found within the Pyramid of the Moon in Totiwakan, the basalt depiction of the great goddess is assumed to be the great goddess of Totiwakan herself, responsible for uniting Totiwakan city. Next to her is Kuatlike, the matriarchal Aztec goddess. The two figures similarly can be seen wearing clothing unique to their culture and region. Both also have no coverings for their chest, except for the great goddess whose hands are bald in front of her breasts. As these pieces were created before colonial rule, there was no precedence of needing to cover up exposed extremities by standards of European puritanical dress. These are also representational pieces, serving as almost a proxy figure to embody the appearance of these powerful goddesses. The appearance of their exposed breasts and dressings should not be seen in the light of vanity as their power was not limited by the fact of them covering or not in the eye of European shame that was correlated with a woman flaunting their body by having a lack of clothing. As we continue, we now enter the colonial era where we have come across the paintings done by Juan Correa and Miguel Cabrera. An immaculate conception on the left, Juan Correa illustrates the biblical story of the Virgin Mary instantaneously being free of sin at the moment of her conception. The Virgin Mary is famous in Latin American art for being one of the only female figures represented in mainstream art at the time. Illustrating a female figure that is not the Virgin Mary can be seen as a change in Cabrera's portrait of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz on the right. Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz was famously one of the world's first feminists, as well as being an accomplished and renowned nun for her time. Still, de la Cruz is not the same famous biblical figure that Mary is. Cabrera paints the nun posthumously in an honoring portrait. She is illustrated as an aristocratic figure for the colonial viewer to revere her. Having a depiction of a woman that is not Mary is a progressive step in the art world, but it is still somewhat limited to the same subject matter as in Immaculate Conception, being figures within the Catholic Church. As Mary reigned as the sole female figure in Latin American art from the Catholic Church and around the world for such a long time, 
her as an allegorical figure could be seen as selfish or vain. It created a precedent that Mary can only be depicted, yet the portraiture done by Cabrera directly goes to diminish that ideology, allowing for a branching out of different female subject matter. Their clothed bodies are vital to their identity as female figures of the Catholic Church, both in occupation and role. If you would care to shift your attention onwards as we progress through the halls of Nima, we can continue to see furthering examples of female portraiture, although still within the realm of artwork painted by men. Cristobal Lozano's portrait of Countess Maria Salazar Gabino is a Spanish Baroque art piece. Lozano was commissioned to paint the Countess herself. While from the 18th century, Saturnino Eran's Tejuana, in turn, was painted in 1914. Eran's wife modeled for Eran, dressing as an indigenous woman in a traditional Tewana costume and a large headpiece, notably being a resplandor. A resplandor is most often a lace headpiece that Tewana women would typically be seen wearing in church, seen as an act of respect to veil within a church building. Despite being painted in different centuries, what Lozano and Eran's paintings share is the elaborate and ornate appearances of both their models. Women have been categorized as selfish creatures that care too much about their outward appearance for centuries. Yet, these two pieces show the importance of these women being able to express themselves through their clothing and accessories. Even though these were painted by men, the sexualizing nature of the male gaze is not nearly as prominent as it is in other works. As subject matter for women's portraiture is advancing, the allowance of having women being illustrated as dressed up in any context, regardless of status and in a non-selfish way, opens the way for more women to be depicted in art in a non-sexualizing manner that doesn't demean women in an overarching generalization. Next, as we walk further along, our focus changes to the differing America, sculpted by Pedro Patino Extonolique in 1830 and Tarsila do Amaral's Anthropophagy, painted in 1929. America is a large marble statue of a woman commissioned by Melchor Musquiz, the governor of the state of Mexico at the time. It was designed to surround the entrance of the tomb for Jose Maria Moreros, a national Mexican war hero in the city of Coatla. America was sculpted by a man, but anthropophagy is the first discernible selection in this exhibition that we undoubtedly know has been created by a woman, as the art world was still predominantly more accepting to promote and popularize the works of men. Her painting Anthropophagy depicts two naked figures, their skin a bright orange with undefinable faces, the one on the left most discernibly a woman due to the protruding breast. Both of these artworks display nipples, America having hers revealed by a sheer fabric. What separates these works is that America still adheres to the European canon of art, of idealizing art subjects, yet Do Amaral does the opposite. What the European art canon saw as idealistic at the time was pale, fair skin, perky breasts, and a lack of pubic hair for women. The bodies of Do Amaral's figures are realistic, exaggerated one might say, and not idealistic in the sense of the European art history canon. America does not accurately represent what an indigenous would look like versus today, yet Do Amaral is able to execute somewhat realistic female bodies to a certain extent. Anthropophagy illustrates an example of the nude female body that art history canon would not romanticize, but there are no vain or selfish undertones applicable to it as Do Amaral's purpose is to depict a semi-realistic female nude as is. The last two pieces that we'll be visiting today are created by Frida Kahlo and Daniela Rossell. On the left, Kahlo's The Two Fridas represents herself in two ways. The Frida on the left is experiencing the heartbreak of divorcing Diego Rivera and is shown in a European-style dress. The Frida on the right is essentially healed from her heartbreak and is seen in a traditional Mexican dress. As Kahlo is almost always a subject matter in her own work, it could be argued that Kahlo herself is self-centered. By comparison, the subject matter in Rossell's photograph is a young woman surrounded and clothed in signifiers of wealth, yet her demeanor can mean that she is unhappy or rebelling against her wealthy status. Someone of the upper class would most regularly be expected to have good posture and well-kept clothing, but the model does the exact opposite. Her dress has high cuts of the sides of her legs, and she casually sits reclined on an expensive-looking couch with open legs. 
What both of these art pieces exhibit is that they go against conventional Eurocentric norms of how women are supposed to look and behave that would consider them vain. While yes, Kahlo's subject matter of most of her artworks are predominantly herself, she refuses to adhere to European beauty standards and keeps the appearance of her unibrow and upper lip hair despite the standard of European women, in contrast, was to shave their hair. With Rossell's work, wealthy slash upper class women are stereotyped as being more vain than your run of the mill everyday woman. Yet, the model is outwardly rebelling against her own wealth, not wanting any part of it, dispelling this preconceived notion of wealth and vanity being synonymous. I want to thank you for being able to join us today in order to dive deeper into one of the many exhibitions that Nima provides. I am glad that you have been able to join us virtually, and I hope that you have enjoyed this exhibition. If you are interested in learning more about the selected art pieces or the artists themselves, please refer to the exhibition catalog that will follow this presentation.